So I called this part one because, as you'll see, I travel a bit. And uh, this slide. And um, <laughs> we, we'd be here till tomorrow if I covered my whole trip. And that's being very selective in the pictures I show. So um, I managed to cover January through May. And I think I saw you had two hours for this. I don't think it's going to take anywhere near that. But so we'll go with that. So who am I? Um, so here's, you can read, um, I live across the river at Abington, but uh, a long time ago, over 50 years ago, I lived in Cherry Hill, and I lived in Medford, and um, I rode the high speed line the second weekend it was open, and figured out how to beat the fare system by using a combination of tickets, so that was my claim to fame, and I, when the, they had like the 40th anniversary of the Patco line, they asked for memories, and I wrote and told them how I cheated them by using different tickets. And I, I said the statute of limitations had probably expired. But uh, so um, I was a CPA, I was a college uh, CFO of a company. I ended up being a college professor at a bunch of places. Uh, I was the president of the Philadelphia chapter. I was a vice president and I wrote the cinders for a while, uh, but I'm on the national NRHS board now. I'm one of nine board members. And the NRHS has this affiliated organization called the fund that holds the money. So if we get sued, like what happened once before, presumably the money won't get taken. And I'm the controller of the fund. Um, I'm an NRA, I'm a modeler as well. I'm a member of the NMRA. I was on the national board. I was a national officer and I'm involved in the local Philadelphia division. I'm a member of a couple historical societies. I call them hysterical societies. And my favorite railroad, as you can see from the picture, is the Illinois Central. That's a picture of me with my layout in my backyard in a garage. And I go from uh, Chicago to East St. Louis at about 20 feet. There's a big coal mine in, in the middle there. So, all right. So I travel. Uh, it seems like I'm home. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm away more than I'm home. And this year we did more travel than we've ever done. Uh, my wife and I, and sometimes with some other friends. Um, so I managed to hit 30 states. I did two extensive road trips. Uh, my wife has um, uh, uh, two bucket lists, one of which is to visit state capitals. And we, we managed to visit 20 of them this, this year. And she's also visiting uh, presidential libraries. And we visited a whole bunch of them. And I like to fly, flies fast. Um, I know how to play the scheme. I have millions of airline miles. I often fly for free. So this year I flew 55 times. I flew 67,000 miles, mostly on US Air, four flights on British Airways, four flights on uh, Cutter. If you ever can fly Cutter, it's a great airline, although they don't fly from Philadelphia anymore. They used to fly from Philadelphia to Doha, but that's gone. But American has picked up the flight, so you can fly to Doha. And I flew twice on Iberian. And I made countless trips on trains. I listed just some of the ones that are on there. We won't see all of these because uh, some of them, like the Everett Railroad and the Western Maryland uh, and even Conway were later in the year. So I like trains and planes. So um, hope people aren't offended, but you're gonna see a few pictures of planes too. So my major trips, um, I go to Cocoa Beach every January for a big RPM meet. I go to Texas every year for the Plano train show. It's the largest train show in Texas. I go to the Springfield train show every year. Uh, I went to Kansas. I, I had a bucket list. I was trying to visit the 100 largest cities in the country. And I had been to 99 out of 100. And the last one was uh, Wichita, Kansas. So we went out there in February. And it was just time so we could go to the best train show in Kansas, which was the same weekend. And I know it's the best train show in Kansas because that's the name of the show. Um, did the Carolinas. In March, we went to uh, Qatar, Qatar. We went to Kuwait. We went to Rochester. We went to um, Colorado and Wyoming to do state capitals, Pikes Peak. I went to the Illinois Terminal, Illinois Traction Society Convention in April. In May, we went to Israel, wouldn't go there now. Um, we went to Illinois and Wisconsin and California and Nevada. And that's about as far as I got, I got in terms of covering the presentation tonight. You can see, I went to Aruba. We did a big road trip in New England, did another Midwest road trip. These were to pick up state capitals and do other things. Um, we did a Danube cruise in uh, September on the Viking. I'd highly recommend that if you've ever 
thought about doing those. A little expensive, but you get, you know, you got a hotel that moves. It's like being on a train and you know, they stop, you get off, you see something. And, you know, we, we made it through, you know, five countries and some other trips later in the year. So I start with a picture of a plane because um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the heritage liveries that Norfolk Southern, CSX, UP have done. Well, the airlines do the same thing. And if you don't fly a lot, you don't see them. And so just like people like to see the Pensy engine or the interstate engine, um, people like to see these. And there's uh, chat groups just like there is for the train thing. So this happened to be AirCal, which was a, an airline in California, uh, kind of like PSA, and it got sucked into American. And honoring them that have American has about 10 or 12 of these livery planes uh, from the different airlines. So this was a trip to um, Cocoa Beach to go to the big RPM meet there, railroad prototype modelers. Uh, this is just a picture of the, the hall, the selling hall. This I think is the first, was their 20th anniversary. So as the RPM people are people that are, they're not rivet counters or they're not scratch builders, but they'll take a model and make it very accurate by adding um, detail parts and paint schemes and things like that. And so um, I like this show. It's a good show. It's the middle of the winter down in Florida. Um, there's a couple of days of clinics. And then at the end of it, there's a nearby train show. So you get a whole bunch of things. So when I wasn't there, we went out to look at the Brightline tracks. The Brightline tracks are on Cocoa, not Cocoa Beach. Cocoa Beach is like over like Long Beach Island. It's out, you know, in the ocean. And here's the tracks. Um, the three tracks, they added a third track for the bright wide. So this was last uh, January. So they weren't doing any running. They, there was some testing going on, but we didn't, didn't see any trains that are there. Um, if you know anything about bright line, you know, they just started running in September um, all the way into the Orlando airport, uh, but there's no stops between West. Uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. Somebody from bright line came and gave a presentation at that RPM meet. And they were talking about everything. And they said, well, the line will be up and running sometime later this year, which it was. So a gentleman said, put up his hand and said, so if I come to the RPM meet next year, I can get on the train in um, Orlando and I can take it right to Cocoa Beach. And they said, well, you can take it to Cocoa Beach, but it's not going to stop. There are no stops between West Palm and the airport, partially because the counties that are up that way didn't want the railroad and they fought it in tooth and nail. So there's like 70 some miles with no stops. Now, now they want to stop. So they're the the areas is called the Space Coast, you know, up by Cocoa Beach and the Cape Canaveral and all that. And then down further, I think they call it the Treasure Coast or something like that. So eventually they may fill in the two stops. But as of right now, there is a station there uh, from when Florida East Coast has trains. It's just the other way of the intersection where I took the other picture. It's all boarded up. Um, I don't know if they could, you know, rehab it somehow. It, the 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 bright line equipment is all high level, so I don't know if it would work. But this has been there for many years. I've seen this uh, uh, on earlier trips. All right, so much for Florida. My next trip was to Texas to go. Um, since January of 21, I've been going to Texas every year. There were no train shows for quite a while because of COVID, and I kind of went into withdrawal and i found out that in january of 21 they were having a train show in texas i said come on let's go so that's the plano show which is the biggest show in texas and i've gone to it every year since i'll be going to it the in a couple weeks from now so this is in west texas uh 50 70 miles south of dallas fort worth um it was a uh Katy station um you might be familiar with the the name uh, west texas there was a very bad uh, fertilizer plant explosion there 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and all of the first responders, like 10 or 12 of them were all blown to smithereens when the place went up. Um, I had pictures of that, but I didn't put it in here, but it was there, there's a nice memorial and, and everything in the town. And we went to see the remains of it and there's, there's absolutely nothing left. So next to the building, there were a couple cabooses, cabis from the Katy. Um, the transfer caboose on the right and, you know, kind of a typical caboose on the left there. So we went to uh, Austin, which was uh, further south. And uh, this was in the LBJ Presidential Library, one of these places we were doing my wife's uh, bucket list. And they had this picture of the Lady Bird special. I wasn't familiar with this, but certainly all of us know that uh, Truman and 
Um, some other presidents, even Reagan had a, a, a train, you know, a campaign thing. And I didn't know that there was one for Lady Bird. So this was a picture that was in the LBJ, LBJ Presidential Library. And um, somewhere I found a description of what it was. So she covered 1,682 miles on a 19-car train. So uh, basically in the South. So this was when um, uh, President Johnson ran for um, a full term from uh, 64 to 68. So one of the places we were going to was the George H.W. Presidential uh, Library. I've been to about 14 or 12 of these, and I would have to say this one is the most involved it's in terms of the history. And if you know your politics is one thing, but Bush did so many different things, and you kind of forget that he was the head of the CIA, he was the ambassador to the UN, he was in Congress. He was the liaison with China and just kept going on and on. And he was also the youngest Navy pilot in World War II. He was like 19 years old. They ran out of college educated pilots and they took uh, people from the uh, uh, prep schools in the East. And so he was a pilot at age 19 and shot down at age 20 or 21. So on the left there is 4141. This is gonna be um, part of a new exhibit, which isn't finished obviously. And so the, the train, which, um, was made in in his honor and this little you know toy one there uh 4141 um, by UP and then it was used to haul his funeral train in, um, when he died uh, so it's going to be eventually put into a big glass addition to the building that's also going to include one of the marine helicopters um, so on the right is a picture of 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 what you know the engine looks like they were selling models of it there were other things and when you go to these presidential libraries, you know, they always have something extra. They don't just have the history of, of that particular president. They usually have a another room where they have a special or limited exhibits. And this uh, this library had one about the trains in 2005, tracks, the, the track of the Iron Horse. And they went through a bunch of things. And then they modified the, the, the poster about that, talking about um, contains um, artifacts related to 4141, 40, which would later pull the presidential um, uh, funeral train. So leaving there, we headed back up. So we, we flew to Texas, did did the other things, and now we're heading back to Plano so I go to the train show. And we're just driving along, and I see this train. And I'll be honest with you, when I put the presentation together, I didn't have a clue where it was. But the nice thing is when you take a picture with your phone, they're all geolocated. So you just open up the picture, click on the uh, information tab, and it told me uh, it was in Norma G, Texas. And just, you know, a typical freight train going by. And I went and looked it up, you know, what kind of model it is. The trains all look the same to me today. I can't tell one from the other. And, you know, they're pretty much all GE and, you know, uh, SD Max and things like that. So, so back home. A couple of days later, I'm up in Massachusetts to go to the Springfield, uh, the big train show at the big uh, the Big E Fairgrounds. I've been going to that for the last 25 or 30 years. I lived in Connecticut for a long time, so it was a lot easier. So this was a, a union station between the 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 uh, the BA, which kind of ran runs to the right of the picture, and the Central Vermont, which is now New England Central, which is owned by Genesee, Wyoming, runs behind the building. Uh, very popular place to go to during the Springfield train uh, show and the parking lot was full and it was mostly people there that, you know, other people that I knew and everything like that. Well, while we're there, two or three trains went by. So the building kind of shakes. This is the actual train show, uh, model train show. I know this is a, a rail fan presentation, but this model on one of the layouts of the Springfield train station was absolutely amazing. And then to the right is the Peter Pan bus company. Peter Pan is based in Springfield. Um, the nice woman on the right there is a British company called Deluxe Materials that sells glue and other things. And every year they have a woman, uh, I guess it's a woman, you never know these days, uh, dressed up uh, carrying an umbrella. And the person walks around the show dressed like that and hands out information and people follow her to their booth. There, I have used their ballast cement. It is an excellent product for putting down um, the railroad ballast. Um, at the train show, they don't just have models. If you've never been there, there's every um, railroad museum. Um, here's some people, the, the Tunnel Inn that some people may be familiar with. Uh, every historical society, 
uh, clubs, things like that. And then on the right, they always bring in, um, well, the last couple of years, they bring in one of the two foot main narrow gauges and they set up about 30 or 40 pieces of track and it goes back and forth and they let people blow the whistle. Um, and if it's very cold there, it's it, 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 the steam is, is, is very sharp. So that's coming up at the January 22nd or so this year. All right, so here's a train to the plane. My wife and I take the train uh, almost all the time to Philadelphia. Uh, we can make it there if the train's running on schedule faster than we can drive. Uh, we always give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. We never take the last train that would get us to where we need to be. We take a train and there's always one train behind us. So we go in a little bit early, better safe than sorry. And this was a day that everything was running late. So um, sometimes we get a train right from the, on the, the, the line from Jenkintown that goes right to the airport. And other times we get off at Jefferson and then we just wait for the airport train, which during the week is twice, twice a week. I'm sorry, tw uh, twice an hour. So this trip was the trip to Kansas. Um, Never, oh, I'd been to Kansas before. This is um, the Union Station they have there. It was built in 1914. They had a situation where the tracks ran right through the middle of the downtown at grade and crossed every single street. And in 1914, the Santa Fe raised the tracks. They built this new station, became a Union Station for them, the Frisco, and also the, the Rock Island. Um, there's um, uh, like an events type of business. There is no passenger service um, now to um, Wichita. The last service was the Lone Star train, which I think ended in 1979. Um, so the this is the top of the station. You can drive up to the top and there's parking there for the union, whatever they call it there. It's a, like I say, it's an event center. Uh, but we, stood, we sat there for a while. There was a uh, a security guy in the, the car sitting in the, off in the distance there. But we watched some trains go by. There's a Spaghetti Works restaurant across the way, and you can see the old name uh, Wichita there. So this is where they raised the, the tracks. At one time, the tracks were at the grade level. And this uh, Santa Fe engine, which was built by Baldwin, I think in 1927 or 28, is over the road advertising the train show that I went to, which, by the way, was at the Cess Cessna Activity Center. If you don't know it, Wichita is the aviation capital of the United States. There are more manufacturers of planes in Wichita than any other place in the country. Um, Cessna is there. Um, Boeing used to be there. You will see that in a couple minutes. Um, the Learjet is there and, and two or three other companies. Um, and the local Wichita State University has a program in aeronautical engineering and things like that. So this engine, so, you know, to the right of the engine was a um, uh, Mid-America Railroad Museum or something like that. I took a bunch of pictures, but I, I couldn't find them. So uh, off to the right, and the, the engine is actually part of that museum. This is the Rock Island Depot. It's it's only about two or three blocks uh, to the east of the Union Station. Um, it was abandoned as a railroad station in 1914 when they uh, came up with the, um, the Union Station. Um, and it's a, a restaurant and some other things, but it, it's in, it was in pretty good condition. At one time, all the tracks were in front of it. There was a yard and things like that. I saw a picture of what it looked like back then. It was absolutely a nightmare. Every street had tracks running it. They were where just across the street is what's called the warehouse district. And that was all the warehouses and things like that, all of which had uh, tracks and, and serving them at, 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 at ground level. So, one of the things we did there was to take a drive. Um, we were heading to Abilene, Kansas, so we could go to the Eisenhower Library. And we just happened to come across Transcon, the uh, Bin, uh, Binsif, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Transcon. And it was supposed to be very busy. Well, here's the three tracks, but we didn't see anybody coming. We sat there for quite a while. No trains came, so we left. And we drove a little further, and we ended up in Newton. And ha there's this massive building. It's a ex-Santa Fe station. So this is the Amtrak station that's the closest to Wichita. They said it's about 25 miles. I don't know, it took us longer than that to drive there, but maybe that says the crow flies or something like that. Um, probably had um, one of the, the Harvey restaurants or something inside of it, but you know, pretty massive. You can see the word Newton written twice, once on the left and then once behind the pole on the right there. Um, now across the street was a fairly active um, uh, 
maybe a division point or some kind of break point where there were, you know, engines being serviced. Um, the one on the right there was a, you know, SD40-2. You don't see too many Santa Fe paint schemes left. I mean, the two railroads emerged, I think, in like 96 or 97. So it was quite a, quite a ways ago. There was a, a turntable and there was some other facilities. And, you know, we drove around for a while, but, you know, I had my wife with me, so I couldn't stay there forever. So we just took a few pictures and moved on. So we drove to Abilene, which is where the town where actually Eisenhower was actually born. And um, on the his presidential library is a little bit unique in that it was actually started before he was president. It was um, to honor him during World War II. And uh, when he became president, the, the purpose of the museum kind of morphed. And when I was there, that was the when they had the scandal with you know Trump having the documents, and then they found them at the Biden library, you know, in the pen and stuff like that. So I jokingly asked the curator if they had found any secret documents. <laughs> he kind of laughed. He said, well, "I don't think so." So this was a Union Pacific station uh, right in Abilene. Um, good condition on um, the other. Well, it's supposed to have been the town's visitor center. Uh, but maybe on a weekday during the middle of the winter, it wasn't open because we tried to go in, but there was nothing inside. This is the end of the building. So I'm looking to the west, and you can see there's an old phone booth there and uh, some information about the town, but uh, there was no way to go inside. We didn't see a lot of trains going by here on the UP. Um, uh, the transcon that goes through uh, Newton had a lot more activity. But a block away was um, the Santa Fe station, which is now a, a you know a maintenance away type of building. And another couple blocks away was the Rock Island Depot. And so there were four railroads at one time in this not so big town, six or seven thousand people. So around the Abilene Depot here, um, there's some western type buildings, um, like old town type of thing. You can see there's a, a a windmill there and across the street from the station is a whole passenger train. I only put in the one picture here, but there's a tourist heritage line here that runs trains from, um, uh, what does it say, May to October, something like that. Um, and they, they go out on, on the former Rock Island lines, which I guess go to the east. So here's some pictures that were just uh, 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 around Abilene, uh, lots of grain. We saw several of these silos, but this was just a little bit west of the downtown area. And you can see there's one line coming in. It was kind of a, a junction between um, maybe an old Santa Fe line and another line or something like that. I, don't, I didn't look at a map. And then just a little bit east of the Eisenhower Library was this facility which I think is a short line. I don't think it's part of the, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. So, so much for Abilene. We had lunch in a nice little uh, luncheonette and things like that, saw the library and we headed back and we got back to Newton and I'm always looking. And so we turned down a different street and what do we find? There's actually a park there. We were on the other side of all these tracks. So we didn't see that in the morning. If you look through the containers, you can see there's actually some engines. So I was on the other side of the tracks and I didn't know this, but this is on the, oh, the Southern or the Eastern side of the tracks. The tracks kind of <clears throat> go diagonally, but more to the South. And there's a little park. You can sit there and watch the trains. So we sat there and watched a, a double stack go by. And then we drove back to uh, Wichita for the night. Driving up in the morning, we passed this huge silo. And my wife wanted to get a picture of it. So the next day I went in and drove probably where I wasn't supposed to drive, but got pretty close to this um, work of art, I guess. Um, lots of different silos there, some of which were uh, kind of broken down um, and lots of covered hoppers, obviously <clears throat> grain, corn, wheat. I guess Kansas is more wheat than corn. Uh, Iowa and Illinois are the, and Nebraska to some degree are the corn states. So we went around for quite a while. On the other side, there's a fairly massive yard and there was lots of equipment there. I just put up a sampling of, of some of the engines that were there, um, switching and you know, actually saw a caboose. There's a big P on it. So I'm wondering if maybe that's a shoving platform. I don't know. I don't know if that's a, you know, like you put an F in the front of the engine, maybe you put a P on it if it's a shoving platform. 
still had windows, but there's no windows on the side of the car. You know, they've been plated over. The only windows are up on the top on the uh, cupola. So the one thing, as I said, uh, Wichita is a big manufacturer of, of airplane parts. And I was looking for some of the cars there that are used to carry them. And so the cars on the top there are the ones that are used to carry 737 fuselages that are made, used to be made by Boeing, but they sold it to a company called Spirit, which makes parts for other airplanes. And then the, the car on the bottom is used to hold like uh, the rudder or the elevators or you know some other part. So I saw these sitting in the yard and then we went exploring and I ended up probably again where I wasn't supposed to be <laughs> in the parking lots of Spirit. And there was a 737. There were actually several of them. This was the one that I got the best picture of. Um, so these planes are all made here. Uh, there's several different models. There's the 700, the 800, the Max. And then they also make the uh, P-8 or P-7 patrol plane for the Navy. Um, so there were several of them sitting there ready to go. You see it takes uh, two cars for them to do it. And they have kind of like a breaker device before and after it. And um, yeah. And then down below is, you know, the, the, the other cars with parts inside, obviously, because they were right up by the factory. So I assume they've been loaded and they're off they go. If, if these are going to Renton, Washington, they got to go, you know, 40% across the country, got to go over up to Montana and then over and, and get to the place in Washington. All right, so that was that trip on Valentine's Day. I took my wife to the restaurant that came in where the Mistori's Diner used to be in Bordentown. It's called DeLuca's or something like that. I took her out to lunch for Valentine's Day. It cost $132, <laughs> fixed menu, uh, ridiculous. I'm surprised the restaurant is still there because the prices were absurd. If you wanted to go there for dinner, it was over $200 and you had to wear a suit and tie and things like that. So I always take train pictures wherever I'm going, just, just a grab shot of the river line. It was a nice day. So this is, I, try, I call this train to the plane. I'm not, the train that you're looking at is actually going um, northbound. I don't know how many of you come over to this side of the river, but Jenkintown, you know, has uh, more service than any other place on the north side of Philly because we have three different lines, actually four, because some trains only go to Glenside. So you have trains going to West Trenton. You have trains going to uh, Warminster. You got trains going to Glenside and then trains go to Lansdale and then go to um, Doylestown. So we get service every couple minutes during COVID. Um, well, each line had a service once an hour, but they staggered them. So we actually had three trains an hour, even during the COVID thing. Um, it's a low level station. Um, this is, you know, the Silver Liner fives and you got to climb up the doors. And sometimes it's hard when we're lugging our suitcases. It would be nice if it was an upper level station, but it isn't. So this trip, we were going down to South Carolina. It's one of my annual trips. I go, there's a fairly decent train show in the right by the Asheville airport. And I have family that live right there. So I go down every February for that show. And we went to Columbia, South Carolina to see the state capitol. Um, and I always look to see what else is there. And this was a fairly modern uh, Amtrak station. I mean, it was, you know, metal building, things like that. Certainly wasn't something that was around in uh, pre-Amtrak service. A couple blocks away, there was this southern uh, boxcar just kind of sitting there. The, the rails were disconnected, so it wasn't going anywhere. And it was hooked up to this uh, Odula mill, uh, which didn't seem to be a mill anymore. And then I uh, wasn't sure what it was, whether it's going to be repurposed into something else. But, you know, I like older buildings. Uh, you'll see I take a lot of pictures of stations and facilities. I'm not so much into taking pictures of trains. I do, but... I'm, I like the older buildings and the settings and things like that, because if you get a picture of it now, because sometimes you come back and it's not going to be there. Oh, th this picture was right outside um, this engine. Uh, sorry, this uh, caboose was right outside the train station and uh, both sides were very sharply painted. I didn't put a picture on the other side, but it was something similar there. You know, trains can't stop quickly. You can, you know, in case of, if you hit a train, in case of a tie, you lose. 
So here's a scene uh, that was alluded to earlier. I go to the I go to train shows all over the country. Like some people travel to go to play golf or to go fishing. I travel to go to train shows. So going to Clark is nothing. It's like a hour, hour and a half drive or something like that. So this was the Clark show. And you probably can see the Jersey guys because you were over there or somewhere in the hall there. So I like that show. It's a good mix of Rare Odeana. And uh, the other room is pretty much models. And I've always come back from there with a lot of material and good stuff. All right, next trip, we went to Kuwait. So I'm a bargain traveler. I don't necessarily uh, know where I'm going. I go where the fares take me. So uh, Qatar Airlines had a sale in March. You could go to a whole bunch of their destinations for $1,000 round trip from Philadelphia. You fly to Doha and you change somewhere else. And it will bore you with the what we went through. But my wife wanted to go to the Szechuan Islands or the Maldives, which are in the middle of nowhere. and take a boat to go everywhere, blah, blah, blah. So we went to Kuwait. Um, I don't have any pictures of Kuwait because there's no trains in Kuwait. However, they are trying to build a freight railroad from Kuwait down through Saudi Arabia, down to Qatar, down to the United Arab Emirates, around the Horn through Oman. They wouldn't go to Yemen because they got wackos there now, but they're trying to build this freight railroad eventually that would connect all those things. And they obviously have the money to do it, and they're just building across desert. So uh, that may come someday. So we spent a couple of days in Kuwait on um, at a resort on the Persian Gulf. Um, happened to be their rainy season, which is like one week a year. And that was when we were there, light rain. But we still got around. We saw some sights and did some things. Um, but we stayed over a night in Qatar. If you're flying Qatar Airways, they have this stayover thing, just like Singapore Airlines has. You can stay over in Singapore. So we stayed overnight, we stayed a day there, and partially as I wanted to ride their train system, which is the world's longest automated transit system. There's absolutely no drivers, everything goes by itself. This thing cost billions of dollars and was put in for the World Cup that was held there, I think, what, two years ago, a year and a half ago, they had the World Cup there. And um, uh, top of the map, you see it says loose sale, QNB, the, that's where one of the big stadiums was, and, and one of the other ones went to a stadium. So you fly into the airport, which is at the red line there, and take that into the, the downtown area, which is kind of where the, the red line and the green line come together, and there's a couple branches. Um, so off we go. So you can see the service was fairly quickly. It was every 12 minutes. The signage was all in English. It was quite a walk from the airport. I remember we walked through like two or three other buildings before we got to this, and then we had to go way down. There were people there to help you. Everybody in these countries speaks English. So I don't know any any words in Arabic, but it wasn't a problem because most of the people that live there are not Arab. They're something else. They're from the second and third world. Um, you know, they do all the work and everything else. I was in uh, Dubai once, and 10% of the people in Dubai are from Dubai. The rest of the people are from the rest of the world. So that's my wife sitting in the family compartment. The trains have three compartments. Oh, I didn't tell you, the, to, for us to go to Kuwait, we had to bring a marriage certificate to prove we were married. Otherwise, we couldn't stay in the same room. Um, but the trains here have three classes of service. Behind the gold door up there, where, where I went and I wasn't supposed to, is women only. That's the front of the train. The middle of the car here was described as family, so that would be male plus female, and then the rest of the train was all males. You, you couldn't have a female. So my wife is sitting there, and I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do this. Nobody yelled at me, but I went to the front of the train to take a picture, and this is the very front of the train. And the cars, I think, were made by Siemens. Obviously, this was done by some type of tunnel boring machine, and it just took off from the airport, you know, it didn't take off, but, you know, drove and went whipping along. And, you know, this was for quite some distance. We made a couple turns. We came to one spot where there was a junction and we ended up in the downtown area and we came up on top and this was the station that we got off at. It was a couple blocks from our hotel. So we came up, we went over to the hotel, dropped our luggage, and then spent the rest of the day exploring um, Doha. This is Doha, D-O-H-A, the name of the airport and things like that. I, we've um, we've been there before because we've done other trips on on Qatar. Um, we we yeah. So this isn't the first time we've been there. So this is um, the 
the what the trains look like from the front. Um, again, I'm in the first car. I guess I probably wasn't supposed to be, um, but this is heading to the kind of northern end of the railroad. We wrote a couple of the lines and I got pictures of all the buildings and the buildings are all weird, kind of like the ones in Dubai. They're unusual shapes and everything else. And we ended up in the Mall of Qatar. Um, I do this very frequently. We end up in malls. Um, I'm not a shopper, but um, malls are usually, everything is in English. Even in any country we go to, the signage is all in English. Um, in some countries where they smoke, there's no smoking in the mall. Um, there had to be a train inside the mall. They had this train driving everybody around. All the signage, everything was in English. Uh, there's a food court, so it's easy to eat because you don't have to deal with restaurants, you know, things like that. Um, and sometimes there's entertainment. Um, we went to visit one in Dubai and we watched women in burkas go skiing. Um, there's a ski resort in one of the malls in Dubai. Um, so we had dinner here and then we watched this show, which was like going to Circus, so Circus Soleil. And it went on for quite a while and people were jumping from the ceiling and doing all kinds of things. And I don't know how often they do this, but you know, we just stumbled upon this. We didn't know anything about it. So back to the hotel for the night. And the next morning we're in the airport. The airport is a linear airport. And to get from one end of the airport to the other, there's what looks to be a train, but it's actually a cable way, you know, like a cable car. Um, we were there in 2015 or 2014 when this was just being built and we watched them testing it and they, the whole train was full of bags of uh, sand and they just did it back and forth. We didn't get to ride it because the gates we went to weren't that far out. But if you have to go to the far end of the airport, you you ride this uh, train. There's two of them, one uh, opposite on, on the other side. So how long was my flight? <laughs> So the flight was about 6,800 miles. I think it was about 14 hours. And you can see it take, took off in the lower right there in Doha. It goes along. It has to miss Israel. So it kind of goes around Israel and went across over to Greece, across Europe, across France, across the Atlantic, over Nova, um, Newf Newfoundland, and, and then down and landed in Philadelphia. I think it was about 14 hours. The longest flight I've ever been on is 18 and a half hours. And I flew from Singapore to Newark nonstop. Yeah, that's an 18 and a half hour flight. Did that uh, on a round the world trip a couple of years ago. All right, so I'm home for a couple of days. It's time to go again. I flew up to Rochester, New York. I'm a modeler in the local NMRA division. and had a weekend operating uh, session where you went to a whole bunch of people's railroads and went uh, to operate them. But uh, two people I went with were both uh, uh, they 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 both uh, subscribed to Virtual Rail Fan, and they both knew that there was a camera up here in Fairport, New York, a little bit outside of Rochester. So we went to go see that, and we were there for, I don't know, two hours or whatever. And we only got two trains went by. We got this one, and we got a trash train. But, you know, trains are trains. There's a couple tracks there, because this is where there's a line in Rochester, the West Shore line, which misses the city proper and goes to the across the bottom of the suburbs, uh, <clears throat> east and west Henrietta, and skips the downtown area. So the next day we were out exploring Rochester. The, the operating sessions are in the, are in the evening. So we had the day to explore Rochester and we went up to the Charlotte Harbor. It may look like it's Charlotte, North Carolina, but in Rochester, it's pronounced Charlotte. Um, I went to school at the University of Rochester, so I learned to speak Rochesterese, and there's a couple other things that they say kind of strange. Um, they don't have soda, they have pop, they don't have hot dogs, they have hots, um, and the Buffalo, uh, Rochester, and Pittsburgh Railroad, uh, which became part of the B&O, uh, came originally all the way up to the harbor, and, and they used to export coal, um, so there was this station here. Um, there's also a lighthouse and some other things like that. I didn't put the pictures of them, but so the, it looks like they were restoring the station. I don't know for what purpose. Um, so we went, ex went around exploring in Rochester. Um, you know, this was New York Central. This was Penn Central. This was Conrail. And now it's CSX. And we saw these two engines and I looked them up and the one on the right turns out it's a road slug. I know it looked a little funny. Didn't have all the the things on the top, like the other one there, both were GP38s. Um, uh, one was an AC and one was a Dash 2, but the, it said that this was converted to be a road slug. So this is 
two engines, uh, you know, switching in a yard or something like that, uh, flat switching. There's no hump or anything here. This uh, caboose was there, and again, maybe a, a shoving platform. All the windows are plated over, and looks like the graffiti got to it. We went into the new Amtrak station there um, and got thrown out. <laughs> As soon as we walked in, a security guard came up to us and said, what are you doing here? And we said, well, we wanted to see the new station. He said, do you have tickets? We said, no. He said, you have to leave. So I guess that's to keep out the homeless. But, you know, we're obviously we're not homeless, but still we couldn't even I grabbed the picture and we left. I mean, he wouldn't let us stay there for like a, a nanosecond. So but they have seats. You know, you go to Mo Moynihan Hall where I was uh, last week. And there are no seats. And you see hundreds of people just standing around because if they put seats in Moynihan Hall, it would be filled with the homeless people. So in Rochester, the Genesee River runs uh, like the Nile. It runs from the south to the north. And when it gets to the little bit past the downtown, it falls off the uh, escarpment. Um, I took a geology course when I went to college in Rochester, and we went on a field trip down the gorge here. And we recorded all the different rocks and the different beds and things like that. And then a week later, we got on a bus and the same bus took us to Niagara Falls and we went down the gorge in Niagara Falls and recorded the same rocks. And guess what? It's the same rocks, the same thicknesses, the same levels. And if you wanna think of something that makes you feel kind of small, you know, that's like a hundred and some miles away and it's exactly the same rocks. So this was, uh, we went there earlier in the morning, tried to catch a train, we missed it, but this is the uh, westbound maple leaf. And this is in April, uh, sorry, in March. Um, and you know what snow they had last year was coming off and the waterfall was this there. At one time, there used to be some hydro activities off to the right. Uh, I didn't take a picture of that, but they had some mills and some other things where they took the water off and then used it in the 1800s. Uh, you can't see the... Uh, it's on the other side of the to, to the right of the river is is what uh, what's left of the Kodak office building. There actually is a we we went to lunch at a restaurant where there were some Kodak employees next to us. There's still about three thousand Kodak employees left. They still make film and some other things, but you know the company's a, a shadow of what it was. All right. So when I flew back from Rochester, I couldn't get a flight back to Philly or whatever I was finagling, flying on miles or something. So I flew to JFK. And I took the air train. So this is the uh, the air train. Um, it's at Kennedy, and I'm, I'm it said Jamaica, but I'm, this isn't at Jamaica. This is a uh, this is at the airport itself. I realize that after I make because I see it says arriving flight. So if you have ever taken this, you use a metro card, and it's a couple bucks, like five bucks or something like that, to take it from the Long Island station. So I got to the Jamaica station, and I actually thought about going to see. Um, Madison, because the Madison station had just opened. I hadn't been there. And you can see on the station there, the Long Island Railroad trains are going to three different stations. They're going to the Atlantic Terminal, they're going to Penn Station, and they're going to Grand Central. Then I thought about taking the train to Grand Central, and then I would take a train north, and my wife was actually coming home from Connecticut that weekend, and I would hook up with her. So I didn't do that. So we're sitting here waiting for a train to go to Penn Station, and this train pulled in and we all got on the train to find out they switched the tracks at the last minute and this train was going to Madison. <laughs> so we had to get off this train and go on to another train. I ended up in uh, Penn Station and then I got on a Jersey train to train to Metro Park and my wife picked me up there and I came home. I'm home two or three days and we're off to Denver. So this is the automated guideway system that's under the Denver airport. and if you're the suspicious type and you're into uh, uh, strange things, you might want to Google the tunnels that are under the Denver airport. It's it's rumored that there's massive cities built underneath the airport and they're all connected, you know, and it's going to be used by the black world or something like that. But the, the airport is linear. The terminals are linear and they're connected by this guideway, which takes you into the head house. So I was standing in either the first or the last car of this. And you get on this from the train, um, um, from the airport, which you can get reached by train. So we'll see that in a little few slides. So we headed to Colorado Springs. Uh, we were gonna go ride the Pikes Peak and we just stopped to eat at this restaurant. I found the restaurant you know, through TripAdvisor or something like that. 
and this has happens to me more than a few times, the restaurant was in a train station. And my wife thinks this is deliberate, <laughs> but I didn't know the restaurant was in a train station. I just picked the restaurant and it was where we were gonna be. So we went in and we had dinner in this restaurant. It was a burger place. Um, and uh, it was built in 1917. And what I found out was that originally it had, you know, one of the Harvey houses. If you look to the little bit of the north of the station, there was a couple of freight cars sitting there, including a, a Rio Grande caboose. There's probably not too many of them left. Um, and if you look to the other side, there was a yard and the very weird looking building there is the Olympic Museum. And we tried to go to it the next day. They do not accept cash. They do not accept, accept MasterCards. They do not accept American Express because they only accept Visa because Visa is the official sponsor of the Olympics. So my wife and I, we have lots of credit cards. We have no Visa. So we didn't get to see the Olympic Museum. And, but we did get to see some trains there. So we drove over to uh, Mantua Springs to get a ride up on the, the, the Cog Railway. Um, most of you probably know it was shut down for about two years. It was totally worn out. And the uh, Broadmoor Hotel people that own it, they came apparently close to walking away from it because they found out there's only like two companies in the world that can build this. And they're both Swiss and they both charge lots of money. And they spent $100 million. They totally redid everything and redid the tracks, the, the, the racks, the cars, um, not all the cars, um, put in signal system and everything else. And so we bought our tickets and we were ready to go. And they told us it's too windy at the top. If the wind is more than 40 or 50, some number, the cars are not allowed to go to the top. So we, um, we got about seven, I don't know, 75% of the way up and they refunded half my ticket price. So I figure I made some money on the deal, right? Because I got three quarters of the way up, but I only paid half the price. But it would have been nice to get up to the top. Apparently, they have um, built a new visitor center. I've, I've uh, lived there. I'm sorry. I've, I've been there twice before, once back in the 60s with the Boy Scouts, and I wanted to see it again. And here's just a historical plaque that's there, you know, saying grades up to 25 percent. The grade on Mount Washington is, is steeper. And I did go there later in the year, but it's not gonna be in this, this presentation. So here's the, the newer equipment um, made by Stadler, the Swiss company, the same company that makes the equipment for the river line. Um, so the engine pushes us up and then we just kind of sat there for a while and then it brought us back and the conductor came on and said, well, you know, we're going downhill, but don't worry, um, you know, the engine will, you know, will slow us down. And if the engine doesn't work, there are two springs down at the bottom to stop us. One of them is Mantua Springs and the other one is Colorado Springs. So everyone said, ha, ha, ha. So we got to ride up. We got to ride back. This was their snowplow. Uh, I couldn't get to the front to take a picture of it, but this is their snowplow. And there was snow when we got up to the way we got up, maybe 75%. We were way above the tree line. I think the mountain's like 14,000 feet. So we got up to like 10 or 11,000 feet. Oh, these are some of the older cars that were there that uh, were reconditioned as part of the, the deal. And this is just the, what, what the track looks like with the, what I call it, a pinion gear or whatever that rotates uh, in the cog. This is all standard gauge. So my wife didn't feel too well and she had to go to a doctor, a uh, dock in the box place, and she looks one up and guess what? It turns out it was in this roundhouse. Again, this happens to us all the time. And this was the uh, Colorado Midland roundhouse. Um, I had seen this thing years ago when it was all derelict and someone took it over and, you know, each one of the bays. So one of the bays over there next to Synergy or so there's a dentist. I think it was in between something. No, that's bare feet. So somewhere in there was a dock in the box place. She went and got a prescription for something and she, she felt much better. So I just got to walk around. I took a bunch of pictures, but I only included one other one here about the, they had in one of the, it was like a restaurant or something like that. Um, I did look up the railroad. I knew it ended, but I didn't know when. It turns out it was actually killed by the USRA. When the railroads were taken over during World War I, you know, when they didn't get the job done, the USRA took over. They looked at the Colorado Mid one and said, there's like three other routes going across Colorado. We don't need this one. So they shut it down. And that turned out to be the end of the railroad. 
So we left there and went to the Air Force Academy. And there's a couple planes there. This is an A-10 stuffed and mounted. There's also a B-52. I didn't take a picture. I couldn't get that. Uh, well, I guess I didn't take a picture because I, I couldn't find the picture of that. But there's a bunch of um, other things you can get a visitor pass and they let you go through um, the, uh, the Air Force Academy. A friend of mine told me to stop here. This was a model train store, really unusual train store. It's in a dying mall. Okay, so most of the mall is empty. And this train store is in what was probably a pretty good sized store in the mall. And he's probably not paying a lot of rent. Um, he, he has layouts, he has birthday parties, he has a space where he runs monthly uh, swap meets um, and more parts and used trains than ever that I've ever seen in a store. And guess what he had? He had the kit to make the roundhouse that we just saw in the picture before. He also had more narrow gauge stuff than I've ever seen before. So if you're ever in Colorado Springs and you're a model or you got to stop at Roy's. So then we drove up to Denver and we could have stayed downtown, paid the park and do all that. But hey, why not stay out in the suburbs and ride the ride? That's what they call the ride there. Ride that into town. So that's what we did. We stayed out uh, by Centennial, which is about 20 miles south of Denver. So we stayed out there and we got on the train, took the train downtown to Broadway. And uh, that's where a couple of the lines come together. Um, at Broadway, you can sit in rail fan because the joint line uh, between, you know, it used to be Santa Fe and, um, Santa Fe and what? Who was the other one? Uh, can't think of the other one right now, but the the, the joint line. So this this was right behind the, the station. You can sit and watch that. We actually went to go to the state capitol and do some other things downtown. So um, we did end up in Union Station. These are the um, same cars as the Silverliner 5s. Uh, the doors are a little bit different. They're, they're only upper level. There's no traps. Um, they run. Th this is the the A line, which goes out to the airport, there's also an N line, I think a W line, and then a line that goes to Golden. And then uh, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, light rail lines. Um, so the, the cars are similar there. There are, still are no toilets, <laughs> just like uh, on SEPTA. Um, so we we rode the line for, well, we bought an all day pass, an all day senior pass. So we could just ride whatever we wanted to do. And you ride one station, the 38th and Blake, and you can sit there all day in rail fan. There's uh, about seven tracks. Uh, there's a whole bunch of engines going back and forth. I don't know where they're going and where they're coming from, but there's more in the distance. You could just stay there and watch the trains. Um, this is something that's missing, you know, given that we go to the airport all the time with our suitcases, we have to put our suitcase sometime in the seat because it's too heavy to lift up on top, plus it doesn't fit. But their trains all have the this rack for the all the trains. Um, uh, rack by the doors and they also have a, a different pattern of, of the when you come into the car the center of the car the seats are two and two so the aisle is a little bit bigger in the center of the car this is um, what was Union Station um, they still call it Union Station but it's now a very upscale Crawford Hotel I looked at staying there but uh, the price was a little bit above my pay grade um, but there's some security guards there that well I guess will hassle you if you try to you know, live there as a homeless person. Um, next to this underground is a bus uh, transit center that I've walked through uh, this trip and previous trips, and it's just full of homeless people. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stores. My wife and I went in here and had a drink. I think we were carded, yes, to get a drink. We're, almost, you know, 69 to 70 years old and we got carded. Um, the next day we drove to Cheyenne, Wyoming to go to the state capitol. And as we're driving up, we saw this train sitting there and a couple engines and behind the engine, guess what? Here's the cars carrying the 737s coming back to get more to take them back to, you know, so this would come like uh, through Colorado and then down by Pueblo and then take a left and go out to Kansas or something. And then the other way goes up to Wyoming and goes across Idaho and, and Montana and, and ends up in Washington. So we drove up in the morning and this train was sitting here. We came back at night, the train was also still sitting there. Um, in addition to seeing the state capitol in Cheyenne, we went and saw the train things. Uh, this is one of the surviving uh, big boys. Um, it's in a park there, stuffed and mounted. Uh, I assume they looked at this when they decided to redo 4014. Um, but, you know, it's in 
pretty good condition cosmetically. Uh, I don't know what it's like mechanically. It, it says how many miles it ran and all that. And then as we were driving back, we just stumbled upon one of these. These are the cars from the Mercy train that the French sent over after, uh, I guess, World War II as to thank us. And I've seen about six or seven of these. Um, the one in New York is quite near where my wife is from in upstate New York. I believe the one in New Jersey has disappeared because I, I looked it up or tried to find it once. Nobody knows what happened to the one in New Jersey. And if you're in Cheyenne, of course, you got to go to the station, um, Union Pacific Station. There's no uh, service there now, but you know there has been even Amtrak service there in the past. So it's been converted into a visitor center, uh, museum. Uh, on the second level, there's a viewing platform that we'll see in a second. Uh, there's a large model um, narrow gauge model, uh, train layout, and some other things. So I'm reading the plaques in the museum, and I read that each rail weighed 456 pounds per yard. <laughs> That's pretty heavy rail, right? I mean, rails like, you know, 112 pounds, 132 pounds. So I got the name of the museum director and sent her a nice correction, and she told me it would be too expensive to replace the sign. So... I guess it was supposed to be maybe 45 pounds per yard or something like that. I don't know. I think it's supposed to be 45 and then with a with a pound sign or something. like. I don't know, whatever. But obviously, it, it wasn't 456 pounds per yard. The, the, that would be too heavy. Um, and there's a viewing platform. So you can sit there and watch trains. This just sat there. It didn't go anywhere. Turned out it was a very windy day. And what had happened was in some places, the double stacks were being blown off. So the trains weren't going anywhere that day. The brick building that's directly over the XPO Logic building is where um, the UP uh, steam shop is. And so it's, I think it's a, like a roundhouse, uh, but that's the building. I had a tour of that back, oh, let's see, uh, 14 or 15 when, uh, when they brought the big boy back, they had a, thing in May. So I'll go anywhere for something. So I flew out and went to that. There also was a train show that weekend. So that helped. All right, we're back to Denver. I put up the Denver map here just to kind of give you a reference if you're not familiar with the line. Um, so we were staying down at the bottom. I circled where we we're staying there, the something village. I can't want to say the word. So we, we were down there and that's a light rail line. Um, and then we took the line up to Broadway where we switched to uh, some buses and things like that. But this day, I needed to get to the uh, National Western Center, which is um, a big, it's where they hold rodeos and, and the Rocky Mountain train show, which is the biggest train show between the Midwest and the West Coast. I had never been to this show. Uh, no, I think I went to it once before. I did, sorry, I did go to it once before. But they, oh, this is their first show in this hall. And they drew 12,000 people over two days. So I, my wife is down at the bottom, staying with the car. I walked to the train, took the train to Union, uh, the light rail to Union Station, switched to a, a commuter train, took the commuter train to the station, and then walked a couple hundred yards and went to my train show. So in order to get to the train station from my hotel, I had to walk across that bridge. I swear the bridge was a mile long. My hotel was on the other side. And I just had to walk and walk and walk and walk. It's crossing, um, I guess, Interstate 25 and then crossing the train tracks and then coming into a parking garage and I come back and get on the train. Um, I don't know why there's three rails there. I mean, it's not narrow gauge. I sent it to a narrow gauge friend and said, oh, they got narrow gauge trolleys here. Um, you know, some type of guardrail, you know. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's a gauntlet track. So I go down to Union Station. I got a picture of the classes, classic train. Uh, traveled by train, went over and got on to the uh, end train. And here's a, uh, a plaque. Do you want to drive this train? They're calling it DTO. So it's like when you go to Sheets, you get MTO or MTG or something like that. So you can learn to drive the train. So as the train is going, I could rail fan. We passed the a yard that was uh, right across from the Coors Field. Uh, you can see Burlington Northern Santa Fe engines. You can see three different paint schemes. There's one over to the right. There's an older scheme in the in the middle there with the large letters. There was a whole train of water, fairly new tank cars, non-portable water. 
and it was like six or eight cars long. So obviously they need water somewhere. I mean, not for steam engines. I don't know for what, but they're hauling water and on what look like almost brand new cars. So now I'm at the National Western Stock Show. That, that, that's the original name of the place. And I'm, I'm looking out and there's a tank train just sitting there. I walked over and went into the train show. It was in this huge hall. Uh, this was the signs outside. Um, I just took a couple pictures there. The, the guy who runs the Ed something, who runs the uh, Union Pacific uh, steam program, he comes every year and gives a presentation. And he asked a trivia question and he says, how many, how many big boys are left? And I knew it was seven because I'd just been to Colorado Springs the day before. So I, I won a hat. I won a UP hat. So, And uh, here's a pen. I put up a Penn Central freight car for you guys there in Jersey there. Um, leaving the, the stockyard, uh, uh, the stock place, if you look across the street, that's the office building for the former Union stockyard that used to be in Denver. That, that, that's long gone. All right, I'm back home. I was out at a friend's house, Eric Davidis. Some of you may know him. And uh, he said, I got to show you this Pensy shed. It's right next to the main line in um, in Thornwood. Thorndale, Thorndale, Thornwood, Thornwood. So uh, supposedly it goes back to the Pensy days. Next day I was out, uh, I went out to the, uh, uh, what is it? Main line hobbies in uh, Blue Ridge Summit. They had a, all day train model train fest. I went out there and you, you go by this ex Western Maryland station with a witch's dome. It's now the uh, town's public library was closed. So we didn't get to go inside and see it. We did do some rail fanning in Gettysburg. These cars were just sitting parked behind the uh, former Reading station there. Here's the, the station in New Oxford. If you're driving on Route 30, you've seen this. Uh, my friend Drew, who was with me, crawled underneath the um, uh, the Pensy cabin car, and he saw markings on it that confirmed to him that this was once uh, Stroudsburg number 11 or something, or number 12 or something like that. He found some markings underneath from the Stroudsburg Railroad. Uh, a couple of days later, I went to an NMRA meet down in Newtown Square, and um, they opened up this museum for a special. It's not typically open this day. And this trolley that ran all the way out there um, and the history of the trolley line is there. So, you know, a nice PCC car just sitting there, not going anywhere. Um, for the first time ever, I went to the York train show where I paid $25. So I was able to go to all the buildings. And now my name is on a list. I can never do it again unless I join the TCA. But I always wondered what this show was like. I had been to it once or twice, just where you, the public could go to. But I really wanted to see what was going on. And it's really amazing. There's like several halls like this. It's all older folks like us selling stuff. And it was just, you know, pretty, pretty much one or two table per person. And, you know, a lot of the stuff was kind of specialized on per tables. But I'm an HO guy and I found all kinds of stuff. So it was nice to be there and I uh, had a good time, although I had to rush through because I had to go somewhere else that day. A um, couple of days later, I'm on the plane to go to Chicago. I, I went to visit some friends and uh, my friend asked me, he had just had his knee replaced. He said, can you drive me to my um, physical therapy? I said, sure. He said, then we'll go to lunch. So I said, okay. So I dropped him off at his physical therapy, which was in Evanston, and I drove around and I came across the CTA. I waited to see if a train would go by, but I didn't get anything. Uh, but I did get this uh, Metro train up in uh, Kenilworth, which is where the people actually live. So I got that. Um, and then the next day I drove down to Monticello, which is about two hours south of Chicago, though it took me four hours to get there because it took me over an hour to drive through Chicago. Um, and this is where the uh, Monticello uh, Railroad Museum is. Um, and um, it's where the annual convention of the Illinois Terminal Historical Society was being, being held this year. And I go to that each year. Um, I like that railroad. It's uh, different. Um, I'm not into the uh, trolley or the the traction part of it, I'm more into the end of it when it was diesel and you know, eventually got taken over by uh, Norfolk and Western in like 1981. So this was a Wabash Depot um, that came into Monticello and it's part of the museum. 
this came from a, a stone and aggregates company in Indiana. This is just, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. It's just sitting there like on the highway to let people know that the museum is there. Um, I'm an Illinois Central fan and the museum has a complete match train of Illinois Central equipment. And that was the real attraction for me to be there. And so there was some activities, there was a train show, there was slides, there was other things from the Illinois terminal. And then during the day, the train was running back and forth. And so you could go out at one time. Um, at the end of the day, the entire Illinois terminal group took a picture at the end, standing on the, the platform of the last car and things like that. And I had that picture, but I, I couldn't find it. Here's a picture of someone you might recognize, or you, you might know the name. Uh, this is Mike Schaefer. He was the longtime editor of the, the magazine for the Illinois Terminal Historical Society. He also did the GMNO Historical Society and did Passenger Train Journal and you know countless other things. He's been around since the 60s when he first started working for Comback. Um, he recently retired so he could do some books and some other things like that. So he's given up some of the historical societies, uh, but he is a, a fan of the IT and he's taken over um, uh, heading up a uh, 501c3 that's trying to save one of the stations, I think in Union, Illinois. So at the uh, museum, um, they just got this Illinois terminal engine. It had been through a whole bunch of things. So that's what the engine looks like now. And I found a picture online of what it looked like when it was in Illinois terminal service. And it's pretty close. I mean, with the stacks are a little bit different. It has the bell. It's a different bell. I don't see any horns. <clears throat> and, you know, it's missing some lights and some other features. Um, but they're going to restore it uh, back to this. Um, they tinkered with it and they got it running. Um, they bought it like a Hulk, like a whole Hulk. Hulk. And, but they managed to get it running. And uh, so we'll see what happens in a couple of years. Um, the whole bunch of equipment there, I didn't include all the pictures, but you know, an Illinois terminal, it was Illinois traction, it was Illinois terminal, they used both names, um, transfer caboose. This is uh, what's called stair tower. It's actually not a real tower. It's a replica of a tower. And then they they got an Armstrong machine from somewhere else. And there's a model board and things like that. And there's a docent up there that explains it to the public. But um, the museum was open that day to the public, but there was a uh, hundred and some people from Illinois Terminal plus some other people there. So uh, they really didn't need to explain what was going on. Um, this is my wife, Carol, and um, we're flying to uh, Madrid. So we could go to Israel and uh, we got upgraded to business class for free. So that's the nice thing about doing some of the flying that I do. Um, you get status and you get points and every once in a while they toss you a bone. Uh, we just flew to Portugal two weeks ago and we got upgraded for free. So, hey. Um, so this is a trip to Israel. Um, a, a friend from college moved there and she invited us to come visit. So we went and we spent a couple of days in Tel Aviv. Um, Israel has a very modern expanded rail system um, and you can take a train right from the airport and a couple of minutes later, you're in downtown Tel Aviv. Um, all modern equipment, this is a double deck type of a, a European type double deck equipment. Um, and like I say, a couple of minutes later, you're in, you're in Israel. Uh, sorry, you're in you're in Tel Aviv. This is the view from our hotel. Um, we stayed at the Crown Plaza. Um, I stay at Holiday Inns a lot, and I have elite status with them. And they put us in their presidential suite. We got a three room suite. It was unbelievable. And this was the view out the window. The buildings that you're looking at directly across the street there. It, is the equivalent of the Pentagon for Israel. This was the center for their military. And there were hundreds and hundreds of military people, some of which were carrying machine guns uh, going back and forth behind where I'm standing or uh, taking the picture. The other way is the train station and people commute with their machine gun. Um, and they walk through the station and everything else. But this is like the equivalent of their, um, their, their, their Pentagon. We went to a couple places in, in, in there, and 
I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, a lot of the older parts of Tel Aviv are being uh, disappeared or disappearing with the redevelopment and things like that. And so they did a project to kind of um, keep them um, and they realized the buildings aren't gonna stay. So someone did 3D drawings of all the buildings, the historic buildings that they're looking to keep. And then, then they printed them in, in, in with 3D printers and uh, they had some other buildings that have been lost already. And so it was just kind of interesting, you know, being a modeler to see the, the this type of things. So here's a, a map of the, um, the, the, the uh, Israeli rail system. And it's very similar to SEPTA in the sense that lines come from one spot, they go through downtown Tel Aviv, they stop at all four Tel Aviv stations, and then they go north somewhere else. So almost all the lines come through. <clears throat> um, we, we got off at the uh, Ha Shalom station. Um, it looks like there's five different things, but it's all running on, on the same the tracks. Uh, if you go north up, you, you go to Haifa, uh, the lines go up just a little bit south of the Lebanese border. And then uh, down on the bottom, uh, they go down almost to Gaza, you know, where the trouble was back in October. And then the line that's kind of um, uh, uh, green uh, going off to the right, you see it says Ben Gurion Airport. Um, that's the line that now goes to Jerusalem, and we'll see that line in a, in a couple of minutes. But first thing we did, <clears throat> so our hotel is off to the right in this picture. The train is off to the left. Uh, there's a highway there. Off in the distance, you'll see a whole bunch of cranes, and they're described as the official bird of Israel. There are cranes everywhere. There's construction going almost everywhere. Um, in fact, the hotel we were in, had a round building, a triangle building, and a square building, and they were building a spiral building, and there was all kinds of cranes there. So <clears throat> we walked um, up those stairs because the escalator was broken, went across uh, where the cars are into a mall. Again, I like being near a mall, food court, store, all that kind of thing. So we very frequently stay near a mall, and then our hotel was, was right there. So we're off to, um, to go to Haifa, and um, this was a train that went by as we were there. This is diesel powered, even though the line is electrified. This is one of the trains like you took from the, uh, the airport. And we took the train up to um, Haifa. I don't know, it was an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and a half, wasn't that far. Um, some places it ran right along the coast. Um, a lot of it was agricultural. We saw a lot of uh, fruit growing under uh, cheesecloth. We didn't know what it was. And I asked somebody later and they told us it's bananas and they do it, the birds will eat the bananas. So there's a whole bunch of stations in Haifa. There's commuter service in Haifa. Um, so we went to Haifa for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> and while we were standing there, our freight train went through and um, I just took a picture. They actually uncoupled one of the cars or they uncoupled the engine and left the car sitting there. And you can see they use uh, European style you know, bumpers and then uh, a pin and uh, uh, a lock type of mechanism that we haven't used since the end of the, the 19th century. Um, this is a Euro 4000. I looked it up and it's kind of a strange looking engine, a little futuristic round there, a diesel. Uh, so the I don't know where the electrification stopped and where the diesel uh, took on. There's no wires here. So it's electrified certainly by Tel Aviv and maybe to the south and, and certainly to Jerusalem. But somewhere to the north, uh, the train switched to diesels. So one of the attractions of, of um, Haifa is the Baha'i, which is a Eastern type religion. It's kind of like the Quaker religion of the Middle East. It's a peaceful religion. And it's based in Haifa, and they have these temples. In the you can see the one in the middle of the picture there, and there's one at the bottom, and there's one at the top. We wanted to go see that, but it was the week of their World Congress, and it was closed unless you were a card-carrying Baha'i member. So we got to see it. We actually chartered a taxi who took us all the way up to the top. He took us to the top, the middle, and everything. We we saw all that. So um, there were these billboards there for um, this railroad, which is fake, um, but there was the Hijaz narrow gauge railroad that at one time ran all the way from the Ottoman Empire up in Turkey, down through Lebanon, through Israel, um, and ran all the way down towards Mecca. And if you ever saw the Lawrence of Arabia movie, 
that's with the line that the you know the British were attacking. Um, so <clears throat> that railroad was, you can see, it's kind of a strange gauge. It was three foot five and eleven thirty seconds of an inch. Um, I guess because they rounded it to the 1050 millimeters. So we saw a couple of these ads um, and it turns out it's kind of like um, graffiti art. Um, but I thought it was a real railroad when I saw them because I knew there had been these other railroads there. And, and like I say, the name is, is different. So one of the things I wanted to ride was the Carmelit, um, which is an underground funicular railroad. Um, it, it Until they did some things recently in, in Tel Aviv. It was the only subway uh, of, of sorts. Um, it isn't very long. It, was, uh, it only has two cars and has a couple stops <clears throat> and basically it takes you up to the top of the hill. And, and so you get on, they, there's guards there with guns. Everybody checks you. I, I felt very safe there because half the people there had guns. Um, so you get on the thing, it comes down. It's, it's a cable driven thing. And um, like, the inclines in Pittsburgh, kind of, and you got on it. The uh, cars were bigger, you know, it was two cars. It was bigger than the, the inclines in Pittsburgh and took you up to the top. And you walked a little bit away from the station and you had a spectacular view. So we basically rode up, saw the view, and we rode back down. And then we headed to the Railway Museum, which is in the original station that was built in Haifa in like 1892 by the Ottoman Empire. They don't use the station anymore, uh, but the, the museum is in an active rail yard. So in order to get into the rail yard, we had to give them our ID and I don't carry my passport every day of there. So I gave him my Pennsylvania driver's license. He took it fine and wrote it down. And then we went into the, to see the train museum. And we were there for quite a, I don't know, an hour and a half or something. My wife just sat and read a book and I just walked around. So this is the view looking one way, and uh, this is the view kind of looking the other way. Um, so the older buildings with a modern roof were the original like freight houses. The, the building there that's camouflaged was a, a British uh, armored car that was made out of concrete in the 1930s when there was kind of troubles. I've seen other pictures of this um, where it was sitting on an American flat car but now it's sitting on a European one. You can see the bolsters there, but you can go inside of it and everything. And they had pictures of it when it was in operation. They had the Lewis machine gun, which had a round deck of bullets that sat on the top and they had machine guns and everything out the top there. And there, there was a couple of nicks in the side. So I guess somebody shot the concrete, but the, the walls were like six or eight inches thick. So I guess it would stop a rifle, but it's not gonna stop a, a RPG, but they didn't have them back then. So there were just lots of cars. You could just walk around and, uh, you know, I did that. My wife sat and read her book. <clears throat> Here's just some examples of some of the equipment. Uh, there is some narrow gauge there from that uh, railroad, the Herzog Railroad with the, the three and a half foot gauge kind of, um, an old box car, um, some kind of flat car. The two engines that are here were both uh, expropriated from Egypt when they had the war in uh, 56 and the war in 73 um, when they invaded is uh, the Egyptians when they left they took the trains so um, they these were both um, EMD export models if you look on the top there I took pictures of some of the the uh, covers for the bearings the one on the right says Hyatt it says EMD up on the top so these were e, uh, General Motors export engines that Israel seized and, and kept running them after the war. Uh, the one on the left was British. There were some other British ones. The one on the picture on the far right is a um, McCormick tractor that they turned into a shunter. And so it has bumpers at each end and pins. And so they could use the tractor to haul around some rail cars. Um, tried to take a picture with my phone. You, you can't see the platform, but the, this day we're heading to Tel Aviv and uh, it didn't quite come up, but you can see the signage is a mixture of English and, and, and Hebrew. Um, so we got on the station above the one that's showing there um, and this was in the train and we're going to Jerusalem, which is abbreviated JLM. And this was the new line. It opened about a year and a year, year and a half ago. A good chunk of the line is underground because Jerusalem is much higher than Tel Aviv. And so that the trains wouldn't be going up too steep of a grade, they kind of stay below ground. <clears throat> and you'll see what happens in a second when we get to Jerusalem. 
This is the station in Jerusalem, the interim station. Eventually, the line is going to be extended and it's going to go to two or three more stations. It doesn't go, come to downtown Jerusalem. It actually stops a little bit on the western edge of the of the city uh, <clears throat> next to their bus station. But it's 80 meters underground. So do the math times three. It's like 260 feet below the ground. It's further down than Madison in, at Grand Central. So there's there were four tracks. Um, here were the cars coming in. They're electrified. And there were six, six escalators to get to the top. And this was one of the six escalators. So you go up, you turned, you went the other way, back and forth, back and forth. The last two operate, uh, escalators were not as big as this one. Um, I didn't put a picture in here, but there are blast doors that they could set up here. Um, so, And the platforms here are very wide. So this could be used as a bomb shelter in case of you know missile attacks where the Iron Dome didn't work. Um, this is almost to the surface. You can see there's still another escalator to get up to the street level. Um, you know, fairly modern. It's only about a year or two old. Right outside is um, a tram. I've, I've been on the tram on a previous trip there, but uh, we had to go to the southern part of the city where all the American expats live. So we just took a taxi. My friends that were there said, oh, we need to take you to the first station. I said, OK. And so they the next day they took us here for breakfast or for brunch, whatever. And this station was built in 1892 when the railroad came to Jerusalem for the first time came on a kind of a roundabout way to get through the mountains to get there. It took two, two or three hours to get there. Um, and so this station has been restored. This is what it looks like on the outside. And it's now like an entertainment complex with stands selling things. You can see the tracks, um, food. We had some breakfast and stuff like that. And my friend Debbie said, she, she knows I'm a model. She says, oh, you have to see this. So she took me to the train on the left where there's a model train layout but it was closed. Uh, but we came back later and it was open. I didn't put a picture in, but it was a, a, a Markland layout that basically goes from all the way around from one end to the other of the car, kind of like horseshoe curves at either end. So um, the friends we were with um, said, um, when, when we were working out the plan and they, when they said, when we were coming they said, oh, we're going on vacation. I said, where are you going? They said, well, we're going to Tiberias. Where's that? On the Sea of Galilee. Can we come with you? Oh, sure. So we ended up driving the whole length of Israel with them to the Sea of Galilee. I'd never been there before. Um, did not know that the Sea of Galilee is below sea level, kind of like the Dead Sea. But I've been to the Dead Sea, and that's like wet, slimy stuff. This was, uh, I don't think nobody was swimming in it, but they were out there catching fish and other things like that. We did go up to the Golan Heights to see some wineries. And we passed the military museum. And if anybody's into military equipment, that's what's known as a Super Sherman. The Israelis took a lot of Sherman tanks from World War II. They redid them and put extra guns on them and everything else. And they uh, ran them up until the six day, um, up until the 60s, uh, 20 years after World War II. So we stayed with them for a couple of days. We took a bus from uh, Tiberias over to uh, Haifa. Uh, a different station. We were on uh, this, I don't know how to say all these stations. We we're on the coastal line. And here were all the trains. This was another Euro 4000. And we took a train back. Um, oh, this was the train we took. And we took the train right from Haifa right to the airport. And we got to the airport. And it was in the evening. And our flight was at 1220 a.m. the next day. I have uh, lounge privileges with my status. So we spent the time in a lounge. We went and got on our flight, um, flew back to JFK. Um, couldn't get a flight that they don't fly to Philadelphia. And there are no American airline flights from Philadelphia to uh, JFK. So we had to fly to Boston and, uh, and then fly from Boston to Philadelphia. And that flight was oversold. So we got a $500 voucher, which we used on another flight. And while we were in Boston, what did I see? Another airplane with a livery. This is an Air Canada Heritage livery for the Trans Canada Airlines. So this was a plane sitting on the ground in Logan. All right, next trip, you're getting close to the end here. I went out to Wisconsin. Um, one of my daughters was graduating from a college out there and I was driving around and I saw these 
hopper cars. They're orange. That's my favorite color. And I thought they might be Illinois Central, but they're Canadian National. They, they might have been Illinois Central at one time. My daughter took us to a winery, and it turns out it was next to the Fox River Trail, which was a Milwaukee Road uh, line that ran south from Green, uh, Green Bay. And about 25 miles of it is, is now a, um, a bike or a hiking trail. And then we headed out to California. This is the California Northern Railroad, which is obviously is Genesee and Wyoming. It serves some packing plants and some other things in, in Woodland. There was a train museum there. Uh, unfortunately, it was closed. There was some Southern Pacific people there. I couldn't get some good pictures because the trees were in the way, but the weather was nice. We headed to Sacramento. We wanted to go see the state capitol and the, uh, the transit system there, it, believe it or not, it's 50 years old. They've been running these trains since the 70s. Um, they were one of the, I guess, San Diego and them were like the first in the country for the re surgeons of the light rail type vehicles and they run right through the downtown. I was trying to find someplace and I made the wrong turn and I was driving down a street that I wasn't supposed to be on, supposed to be only for the, the light rail vehicles, but I didn't get a ticket or anything. So, And then we headed to Nevada. We drove up the mountains, uh, went through um, uh, the mountains. No, oh, I had a picture of the snow. All right, so we went to the Nevada State Railroad Museum. We're heading to Reno. And in Reno, there was a meeting of three organizations, the NRHS, and there was a board meeting, and that's why I was going. The Railroad and Locomotive Historical Society was holding their annual convention, and something called the SP Heritage Center that I had never heard of before was holding their annual meeting. So these three groups got together, had a meeting in Reno, uh, Sparks actually, and then they had trips. <clears throat> the first trip they had was going to the, this museum, and I emailed them and said, well, I'm going to be driving there. Can I just go to the museum and meet you there? And they said, no, no, you can't do that. So I showed up at the museum and I told them my story. They said, here, just make a donation. Fine. So I got to go to the museum, even though I didn't pay to go on the trip, which was like, you know, 90 or hundred dollar thing. It didn't make sense for us to drive all the way up there to drive two hours back on a bus. So we did it on the way up. So this has a lot of equipment. There is a small loop of track around this museum, but everything is very, um, you know, nicely restored. Mostly Virginia and Truckee because that, you know, that was the railroad there. Whoops, sorry. So several of the cars were made, uh, the engines were made in Philadelphia. And so the, you know, the builder plate is there or maybe a replica, maybe someone stole the original, but you can see this one was made in 1875. This was made in Pittsburgh in 1882. This is, um, a narrow gauge one, the, I don't know what the Denver Southern and something railroad. And then this one was made in 1875 as well. This is one that's uh, not going anywhere. I think it's stuffed and mounted, but this is out by the highway. So you can see the, um, you know, the, to get people to stop at the museum. So the, the people came down by bus. They were here for a couple hours. And then they were supposed to go to the Virginia and Truckee Railroad and get a ride on the actual Virginia and Truckee Railroad. And then they would go back to Reno or Sparks. So we tried to find, tried to find, oh, I'm missing some pictures here. Oh, no, I don't know. I thought, I, that's strange. I had some pictures there. So we, we found where the Virginia and Truckee loads in Carson City, but there was no train there. So we kept going. So we drove all the way up to um, Virginia City and we came across um the train sitting there and and the they 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 got on the train they went south for a while they came back and then they stopped so they could visit their shops so i actually parked on the other side of this walked through the train took the picture walked back on the car uh, and oh and i'm missing a whole bunch of pictures oh i don't know what happened i had pictures of the train and the station i don't know where they went all right so this is my hotel room in sparks nevada it was uh I can't think of the name of the casino, but it's a, you know, an independent. So this was like looking out the window every day. You're, you're going to see it a couple of times because every day the trains change. So this is the big now UP yard. It was originally SP. And then the trains used to run, you know, a little bit to the west and, and run right through the, the city of Reno. So one of the trips took us to Portola, 
which was the Western Pacific Railroads Museum. And they have all sorts of, of, of things there. Um, here's a, a map of the Western Pacific. It was fairly a late railroad. I think it was built like 1910, 1912. And it basically was built to get some competition um, against um, you know, the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific and it didn't really go very far. It just went from Salt Lake, you know, down to the Bay Area. And eventually, you know, it got mopped up with the, you know, with the Missouri Pacific and the Western Pacific and got taken into the Union Pacific. So this museum describes itself as the largest railroad museum devoted to a single railroad and related ones. And, and I think they stretch it a bit and you'll see from, from some of the pictures. So, I mean, here's a typical Western Pacific engine, but if you look, there's Southern Pacific equipment there. There's this engine, which was interesting to me because it was from Kennecott, and I worked for Kennecott Mining Company back in 78 and 79. And I asked somebody, I said, why do you have a Kennecott engine? They said, well, when we first started, we would take anything. They said, we wouldn't do it now. And they said they were looking to trade it or, you know, send it to another museum, like, you know, send it to the... Nevada Northern, where it would make more sense, although it didn't, I, I don't think it ran there. I think it came from one of the mines. Uh, Kennecott had mines in Utah, Nevada, and two big mines in Arizona. And I think this was down in, at Ray or one of the other mines down there. Here's a, you know, remember the, the, the Kodachrome engines, right? With the S, you know, what was it? SPSF, shouldn't paint so fast or whatever it was called. I don't know about this one. <laughs> um, it looks like it needs a little work. Um, there's no markings on it or anything. This was a sugar beet car where they um, they said it ran pretty late and they had the extensions on the side because they're hauling sugar beets, you know, to make sugar. Um, and they're very light, relatively speaking, so they can expand like in a wood chip car. They raise the sides. You know, why is this there? You know. Well, the SP or SP took over the Rio Grande and then the UP took over all that. So like I said, they, they stretch it. There's, there's anything somehow related to UP. They should call themselves the UP Museum because it's actually UP and all the predecessor lines, but they call themselves the, the SP one. So it said that we were going to go to here and then we were also going to go to a lumber um, uh, mill. So they took us to a lumber mill, but except they, they wouldn't let us inside. <laughs> So we had to stay on the other side of the fence. So this was um, in East Quincy, California, and it's about six, uh, five or six miles from here to a connection to the UP, which was originally the Western Pacific. Um, and you'll see in the next picture, they have a switch engine. They load up these uh, lumber cars with wood. And behind this was just fields and fields of this lumber. This uh, Sierra Pacific is a fairly large um, paper company. Uh, lumber company. Here's their engine, a nice uh, older switcher. I didn't look up to see what it was. On the way there, on the way back, the guides pointed out the line. Can you see the line that goes across like the upper third of the picture? There's like a, a line going across. That's the former right of way of the narrow gauge Nevada, California, and Oregon. And believe it or not, there was a narrow gauge railroad that actually made it from Nevada to Western Oregon. And it eventually was bought by the W and P, uh, the Western Pacific, and then they standard gauged it and the line ended like in the thirties or something like that. But in downtown Reno, there's their depot, which is now a restaurant. So we had to go eat in the restaurant. So you can see they, they had a quite elaborate facility there. They had a roundhouse um, the building that's in the lower left of the picture is is the depot building. It was a nice restaurant and they had, you know, pictures and things like that. It served like kind of bar food and things like that. It didn't really have entrees. It was like plates of things. But, you know, hey, we went more to see the building than this. And this thing lasted up until uh, 1930s. <clears throat> this was part of the, the, the conference I went to. And there's this SP Railroad History Center. And like I said, I had never heard of it. Basically, it's an association of former SP employees. And throughout the two days, they had panels. They had the former president of the railroad, former CFO, and they talked about what they did right, what they did wrong, 
you know, and then would have been, could have been, should have been a lot of that type of stuff. And you can see everybody's, you know, kind of our age. And it was for someone who has a, a business background, I wrote my doctoral dissertation. I actually have a doctorate degree in accounting on railroad accounting. It was, it was interesting to hear some of the things that they were talking about. And I could have spent, you know, a good part of two days going through these presentations, but instead I went to, on the trips and then I had to go to the NRHS board meeting. This was the view out my hotel window another day. Obviously the trains kept changing, different engines coming in. <clears throat> One of the trips took us up to see uh, Donner Pass. You know, that was the place where the people got stuck and ended up having lunch, you know, from some of the people that didn't make it. And the, the line going across there is that. This is in May. Um, they had record snowfall this year. They had 30 or 40 feet of snow up there. And we were supposed to go through a tunnel uh, that's not for rail service anymore. They even gave us a little flashlight. So we've, we've been able to go through the things and we got there and this is the tunnel. That big white thing in front is snow blocking the tunnel. There were some young people there. They went down and actually walked over the snow and came out the other side. But we were supposed to walk through the tunnel and the bus was going to pick us up at the other side. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. So we came down on the other side and we were in Truckee and um, there was a museum there. And there was some equipment. And again, some of the pictures are missing. I don't understand. There should have been two other pictures. Well, I guess there's enough pictures there. Um, driving around Reno, we came across an Air National Guard base and they had a nice Phantom II up there stuffed and mounted. Um, back to my room again, you can see it's all changed. We have a lot, lots more engines. I mean, I literally could have stayed there for hours just watching the trains go back and forth and back and forth. Also, the airport was off in the distance. So I could sit in the room, watch trains, and then watch planes land. Uh, Southwest by far was the one with uh, most of the planes. Uh, <clears throat> one of the days um, that I did do the conferences, I went out for lunch, and two blocks away from the hotel was a small museum, and they had this station, which had been relocated. So you can see the Sparks was uh, 247 and a half miles from San Francisco and 538 and a half miles to Ogden and it's 4,413 feet. And next to it was um, an engine number eight. It said courtesy of the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City. And there was some other equipment there. And I kept walking, oh, the building that's just over the top of the station is where the hotel, uh, where the, the, the casino uh, where we were staying. But across the street was an In-N-Out Burger. And if you've ever been out West, this is kind of the way people used to look at Steak and Shake back in the Midwest, you know, with the rail fan people and stuff like that. So it's a kind of a cult type of thing. There's none of them anything further East than, than Texas. I think I've seen them in Texas. Very limited menu. The, they have a lot of off menu things. You order things gorilla style and you can Google it all. There's all this different food you can get that's not on the menu, but the menu is very simple. All right, so we were leaving now. Uh, we went to the NRHS board meeting and we're driving back to Sacramento. We actually flew to Sacramento um, and I said, well, let's stop and see the depot. And so this was the SP depot um, and it's now an Amtrak station. And the tracks used to literally run through the whole downtown. And when the trains came, it used to totally disrupt everything. So in the early 2000s, they started something called Retrack which stood for the Reno Transportation Rail Access Card. And what they did was they sold the track 2.3 miles to the city of Reno and they lowered it. When they lowered it, they found all sorts of things. They found secret tunnels. They found one building had a basement that nobody knew about. They found other things that had been there for like a long time. So the everything was lowered below grade. And so this is where the trains run now. And when I got there, Again, California Zephyr showed up, number six, going back to Chicago or heading to Chicago. And a whole bunch of people that had been to this event, it was over, were getting on the train and going home. And we just kept driving to uh, Sacramento and then we flew home. And this is what we saw when we arrived back. We took a red eye flight to Charlotte and then changed to a flight to Philadelphia. We got to Philadelphia. And if you've been at the Philadelphia airport by train for the last three years, they've been working on rebuilding the, the platforms there. And um, they're almost finished the one on the left there. You can see two guys uh, putting down the, the, the rumple strips at the end and they have the, 
this one blocked off and apparently they're going to try to fix finish one half but this has been going on for well COVID probably got in the way but at least three years and you would think they could have got this done that's you know it's rare to see anybody working there and if you do see somebody there's three or four people and this has been going on for a couple of years so this is my last picture this is Memorial Day weekend my wife's from Utica New York and we went up to visit her family and uh, didn't see too much but we went to go visit some family or something and we past the hair caboose, which is sitting on uh, some Lackawanna track that's uh, just south of, uh, of Utica. And I was, uh, I was in uh, 30th Street Station the other day, so I thought I'd just end it with a Christmas tree. So that's uh, five months of my year, seven more to go. And if uh, you have time, maybe sometime later in the year, you can squeeze me in, I'll, I'll let you see the rest of the, the rest of the travels. In the meantime, I leave, I leave on January 3rd for Cocoa Beach, and then I leave on January 9th for Japan. I tried to get on one of the Japanese cruise trains. You have to apply in advance because they only take 40 people at a time. Um, they're kind of expensive, like 5,000 for three days. Uh, but I figured, hey, why not? I'm spending the kids' money, so you know, do it. And um, but we didn't get picked for the cruise train. I said to my wife, "Come on, let's just go." So we're we're flying to Japan on the 9th, and. Uh, yeah, and then we got other trips planned. So that's my life. Hope Thank you enjoyed you. it. Thank you, Kevin.